Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Freeston, Director of Quality Improvement at the Early Years Alliance, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar, Language. Mm, I'm going to have trouble saying this. Language rich learning environments, and it's my pleasure to welcome back again Lindsay Weston and Sean Ansel, ABSS specialist early years teachers. Hello there, hi. Uh, and Isabel, lurking in the background in case we have any different questions, and she can answer that way. Um, uh, right, with no further ado, um, I will press on with an introduction for those of you who have not been. I can't make my system's not working. Uh, the structure of the session. Uh, for those of you who haven't undertaken a webinar before, don't be scared. Um, it's very similar to a normal seminar, but it's on the web, hence the name. Uh, it allows us to reach a lot more people at a single session, and also it allows us to record the session. And as always, this recording will be available on the Alliance's YouTube site by the end of the week as are all the others in the series. We will be looking to cover a 30 to 40 minute presentation today, um, and then allowing 15 to 20 minutes for questions and comments. But as, I've, as I say on every occasion, um, a webinar works best when it's a dialogue between those listening and typing in their questions and us. Part of my role is to feed in the questions at hopefully appropriate times uh, to Lindsay and Sean. Um, otherwise, I'll hold them until the end um, to, to make sure they're asked. If you wish to make a question, you should have that toolbox on your screen. You simply type into the box. It gets sent to me and me alone, so nobody else can see it. So don't ever feel as though you're making a publication of, a, of a, an inappropriate question. It only comes to me, um, and then we'll answer it on screen. Because you can imagine that in most cases, if you're asking a question, it's also in the minds of most of the other people um, listening in as well. Um, as I mentioned, this is the fourth in the series of webinars supporting speech, language and communication needs, supported by the Department for Education under their volunteer community support grants for 2018 to 2020, and we're very grateful for that support. Um, previous sessions have been an overview of SLCN development in early years, lost the words about vocabulary, super sounds, identifying and differentiating. Today's is the language rich learning environments, and I'll give you the dates of the EAL and the parental engagement event uh, sessions at the end of today. Um, all of the previous webinars are available on the YouTube site, as I said, um, and so moving on. The aims for today. Um, we're looking to consider what makes a language rich environment. It's a phrase that you'll hear increasingly, uh, very commonly across early years, but actually to analyze what it means, I think will be very helpful. To invite you to question the current physical environment and the resources that you have. Are they truly providing a language rich environment for the children that you serve? Examine the key elements that can impact on the learning environment, both inside and outside and reflect upon a variety of ideas which can be used to support the development of your own settings, language-rich environments. Um, so, no more uh, ado from me. I uh, will hand over to Lindsay to give us the overview of today and how it builds on previous work as well. Okay, thank you. So, to start us off on our journey today, we're going to consider the language pyramid, which we have referred to previously in other webinars. So, because children learn through play, today we are going to firstly consider those links between play and the learning environments. So when high quality learning environments have been considered, thought out and planned for by practitioners, then it tends to follow that high quality play opportunities will also follow. So this mixture of a stimulating learning environment, which then provides opportunities for imaginative, imaginative play, will then naturally lead to high quality adult-child interactions, which you can see from the pyramid diagram is a constant which runs all the way down the side of the pyramid. So these three areas are inextricably linked, so we need to consider play with a good learning environment and then obviously the adult-child interactions coming in, threading in as well. And that's what makes the learning environment a communication-rich learning environment. 
So research has shown that whilst children play, they're building their resilience, self-esteem and also confidence. And as they play, the language that they hear and experience by the adults or other peers around them therefore becomes meaningful, of interest, and so is rehearsed, practised and remembered by them. So play is all about building on first-hand experiences, trying out ideas, playing out scenarios, experimenting with materials, asking questions and solving problems. So therefore the main thing we need to consider and present our children with are play scenarios and learning environments that create these opportunities. So, let's just think about what makes a space language rich then. Some key aspects to consider would be, firstly, perhaps the physical space. Um, I think we have to realise that our spaces need to be flexible. Um, we need to be able to change them to reflect the interests and maybe needs of the children that each year, each cohort presents. We need to consider maybe the position of furniture and how we've arranged the areas to provide cosy spaces. Then the second element is the emotional and sensory space that we surround our children within. We need to consider the impact of colour and lighting and noise, particularly therefore on our communication spaces that our children are in. And finally, the third element is the resources. They are, of course, you and your team. You are the most important resource. And then also the physical resources, as in the actual equipment, the toys, etc., that you're providing to support the children's play. Um, Elizabeth Jarman and uh, Reggio, Emilio, and the Curiosity Approach are all recent you know, groups and experts, and they all emphasize the role that these key aspects play in providing our language-rich environments. So let's think about the physical space. We need to challenge ourselves and really reflect truthfully on our spaces, really consider whether or not are they, um, are they fit for purpose. Um, sometimes um, uh, our spaces tend to stay in that, I suppose, fixed um, organisation year in and year out. And sometimes we just have to challenge ourselves and think, actually, is this really meeting the needs for this group of children? Okay. I would imagine there are separate challenges for for, uh, for provision that's out all the time and for pack yeah, away principles, because in a sense that organisational requirement yes. would automatically think, well, this goes here, yes. that goes there, when mm -hmm. actually the opportunity to reflect on whether that's the most appropriate yes. place. And in a sense, our pack away settings, although it's the most challenging, having to set up every day and put away at the end of each session, are in a, a rather privileged position yes. because they can be far more flexible and react reactive to the children's interests as they change through the week, don't they? Okay, um, so I suppose the best place for us to think about is where do the children have their conversations? Over to you, Lindsay. Okay, so again, we've referred to this activity before. This is actually taken from the Every Child a Talker ECAT Early Language Consultant folder, page 15, for those of you that want to look it up. But we've slightly adapted it to reflect the outdoor space here as well. So this is where we would like you to think about the physical spaces where quality interactions take place, as Sean's just said. So we've provided you here with a, an incredibly rudimentary <laughs> diagram of the setting, but it gives you the idea. Well, <laughs> so the idea is you draw a basic diagram of your physical space and then take the resources as it suggests on the slide. Um, and then you're going to make a little key with the following symbols depicting where talking hotspots take place. So, for example, once you've drawn your diagram and you've observed interactions for about 20 minutes, you're going to add on there maybe a red cross for places where children talk with other children. 
you might like to instruct, for example, put an orange star where adults initiate talk with children, and there may be a, like a green dot or something where children initiate talk with adults. So you keep going for those 20 minutes, and every time you hear one of those interactions taking place, you would add on as many symbols as you would need. Um, and then afterwards, you're going to look and reflect at where those interactions have taken place. And then maybe take a blue pen and mark on there, maybe with a circle, places that you think talking could take place but does not at the moment. So you're really using this as an idea to reflect on those interactions and to marry up the interactions with the provision that you have. Um, and think about where you can develop the physical areas of your learning spaces so that vocabulary is promoted wider. And you might like to consider, for example, is it that the really busy areas promote less talk or more talk? Or do you need more cosy spaces, for example, comfy, quiet areas, as Charles just suggested, where talk is more likely to occur? Okay, so when we're thinking about our physical space, we've got to think about the journey through it. Um, and sometimes we forget but really it's about perspective. So often we'll move through the space from the great sort of position of being adult height. Um, and if you imagine uh, we're entering into this space as shown by the picture, um, as an adult, we'd be able to see over that unit and see that there's a space behind there where we could maybe be engaged in role play or something like that. But if you think about the smallest child within that room, um, what would their perspective be? And probably it would just be those shelves. Now, that unit is useful because you can see through the shelf. But sometimes that's not necessarily um, an option. So for some of our children, they don't know where they're moving or what they're doing. So I think we've got to really think about what is the child's perspective. So one of the interesting um, activities that you could do is to firstly walk through your space from your adult height. And as you walk, take pictures. And then think of your smallest child, get down to that exact level and repeat exactly the same journey, taking photos, and then compare the two. It can be really illuminating. It suddenly can explain why Charlie, for example, constantly will walk through a small world play carpet area because actually he can't see that there's any other way around other than to walk straight through that, that zone. So um, it can really um, open your eyes to how the children see your space. Okay. Um, so once we're thinking about uh, whether or not we're limiting the opportunities for children to reach certain play areas, um, we need to make it obvious to them that this is how you can get there. Okay, So consider what could be done to ensure that a child can actually move freely through your spaces. Okay, so on the next slide, you've got a little image of a classic kind of um, space for children. And I want you to think more around now the emotional and sensory space that our children experience. Um, it, it reflects really about the whole mood and atmosphere of the setting. It's, it's one of those how it feels for the families and children entering into your space. We know that the link between the physical layer of the setting indoors and outdoors, um, can have a huge impact on our emotional reactions to them. And of course, the resulting behaviours then cannot be ignored. Um, so we, we know that PSED, so our, our personal, social and emotional development, is inextricably linked to speech, language and communication uh, development. And I want you to look at this layout and consider, what is your emotional reaction to this space? Michael, what's your emotional reaction to this? It looks pretty busy, uh, and, busy. Yeah. and almost hyperactive. It's very colourful. Yeah. It's um, it's not shouting at me necessarily, but it's very bright. It could be quite intimidating. 
think, yeah. in terms of the amount of, sheer amount of stuff yeah. that's in it. Trying to um, access the resources for a child, um, think about where the arrow is pointing, for, exa for example, if I want something from over there, to actually get to it, to see what it is that I want, it's really tricky. So therefore, maybe I won't bother. Yeah, or maybe that little thread of thinking that I'm wanting to develop might not actually happen because I don't know where to find that particular resource. But so I think. But I also could imagine quite how that sort of space has arisen. It wasn't planned necessarily. It just things have been added, and yes. each of them individually is a really useful, exciting so, thing. Really. The issue yeah. comes in when they're all there. It's almost hyper stimulating, isn't it? Really, and. And in the sense that that can be quite, on the one hand, it could be something of that Aladdin's cave, but actually that's unhelpful if, yeah. you, if you're not stimulating the right sort of approach. And it's about also ensuring that, that the child themselves is being reflected in that space as well, rather than possibly, oh, this might be interesting, this might be interesting, but actually, do I need all of that? Yeah. Just as you're saying how generically it's grown, do we actually need all of yeah. that? Oh, we don't like throwing anything away. <laughs> no, but we can store it in a separate space. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if we consider the next slide, um, hopefully your sensory reaction would be slightly different yeah. to the last slide that we've just seen. So this would ideally evoke a feeling of calm. Um, it's obviously depicting a quieter space for children to read, play or reflect in. It's not overly busy as the last one was. Um, uses less bright colours and overall there's less of an attack on the senses. So um, there's also, as Sean mentioned about pathways, a clearer pathway that a child can see in order to get to the play or book area that can be seen in the picture. Okay, so we're now going to just consider noise. So if we just read the Shield and Doc rules, Quote, so the general effects of chronic noise exposure on children are deficits in sustained attention and visual attention, poorer auditory discrimination and speech perception, poorer memory for tasks that require higher processing demands of semantic material, that's the meaning of words, and poorer reading ability in school performance on national standardised text. So basically lots and lots and lots of noise isn't good for our children. So we need to reflect on here, is the space that we are providing going to give little areas for quiet and solitude? What can you hear um, as a practitioner, again, like in the other activity that we had, just spend a few minutes just standing back and just listening. Whose voices can you hear? Is it the children's? Is it adult to adult? And so on. What happens also when one team member is reading a story? We come across this quite a lot, where the rest of the practitioners, instead of maybe modelling and sitting with the children and modelling again how to sit and listen and show your attention skills to the story, are they actually doing that or are they using it as an opportunity to tidy up? If so, is the tidying disrupting? Is it noisy tidying? Um, sometimes you hear adults' voices are louder than the children's. If you think about the ratio of adults to children, really we should be hearing more children's voices. And therefore, what can we also do to lower the noise impact in our setting, maybe inside and out? And again, you may hear different types of noise level as to whether the children are playing inside and out. Sometimes it can actually be quieter outside than in, which is interesting. And um, there's also, I'm interested in that issue of doing your conversation audit, mm. there's, there's, a, there's a distinction to be made here between that, or is there a distinction, tell me if I'm wrong, between that healthy buzz of mm. noise that mm. we always associate with an active and a positive setting, mm -hmm. and your dis think, discrim uh, d a definition here of chronic noise, and I'm wondering if how, how we disaggregate between the two. Well, I think, it, as you say, it depends on the quality of the interactions. What, what is it you're actually hearing? If you do do that listening audit, is it children actually speaking to each other? Is it children running around shouting? Right. You know, is there a lot of general, just general noise, or is it actually people engaging in interactions that are worthy of the quality interactions? Right. You know, so 
Thank you. Until you've done that activity, yeah. I don't think we're going to really see the it. difference. Yeah, it'd be quite interesting to see. Yeah, okay. So um, if we go to the next slide. <laughs> so you sometimes see these little displays. And I know in my son's school, particularly at lunchtime, they have a noise on the And the uh, dinner ladies, when they're all in the lunch. Uh, in, the, in the dinner hall, they put an arrow as to where they think it is, and then they expect the children to uh, react accordingly. It never seems to work, but there we are. So I'd like us to consider here as well, um, not only maybe the unconnected noise, such as a television or radio, and the impact that this can have whilst it's just playing along in the background, on the child's ability, or even the adult's ability, to listen and hold a conversation. Again, in our experience, um, sometimes when we visit um, day nurseries and there are baby rooms, because the practitioners working in there don't necessarily have that constant ability to interact back and forth and have a, let's say, a conversation in inverted commas with a baby because the baby's learning language, they sometimes feel the need to put on in the background a nursery rhyme CD or something, right. even the radio, so that they've got that noise stimulation the adult has. But actually, is it really what the practitioner should be doing? Should we not be focusing more on encouraging the children to speak and modelling and babbling along with them and imitating the sounds that they're making? I'm not saying it should never be on, no. but I just I have actually been in a setting where it got played consistently for hours and hours and hours, and as soon as it stopped, it just got put on again. So let's just consider the noise that's just that general noise going on in the background that we can control as well. Um, other noisy things to consider, so are the acoustics, acoustics affected by internal or external noise? The height of the ceiling can obviously impact on the noise levels within a setting. Um, can we think about soundproofing materials to help reduce the volume and the levels of noise that are naturally coming? If you're in a church hall, you may be more echoey than if you're in a, you know, a, a purpose-built building. Um, as suggested earlier, a tent or a den within a space can create a feeling of enclosure and comfort, and also can be quieter for the children if they want to come in there. So basically, is the environment arranged with awareness of which spaces are quieter, and more suitable for encouraging speaking and listening? Um, and is there an opportunity to create a quiet space or somewhere where children can go that's also inviting for them? Sorry. So, I was really contemplating what Lindsay was saying then. It's, uh, I was enraptured with your, your explanation. So, let's think about colour then. So, um, how colour can affect you, it can be huge. Do you respond personally as an adult within your setting? Do you, how do we respond to varying depths and shades and mixes of colour? Imagine yourself as a child wanting to spend time with a friend looking at a book together. What would be your vision of that ideal space? Um, what, what would you need maybe to be able to just focus on the pictures in the book the props that you might be using to support the story or even the props that you might need to use in order to develop your own narrative with all of those colors around potentially it's hard for you to be able to distinguish exactly what we might be thinking about um, historically there's a strong movement of linking color with young children so young children's nurseries and um, their, their kind of um, that sort of equipment and toys were very brightly coloured, etc. However, however, I think uh, the thinking and research has moved on. Um, I suppose one of the colours that jumps to mind just from that picture there is red. Now, positively, if we associate the colour, we think of red, it can be linked to physical courage and strength and energy and warmth, but then also Negatively, most children will associate the colour red with stop, with danger, um, aggression. We often might link 
the colour red, I see red when I'm angry. Um, that's not me personally, but it has heard people say that. Um, so it can be, you know, visually sort of very disturbing and uh, Interestingly enough, it's the most popular colour that we wrap our children in in their school jumpers when they first start school. Many schools would have red jumpers. Is that right? Yeah. But, and I kind of think, why really? When it, to look at a sea of red figures around you could be thought of as very distracting and upsetting. So. Red is a powerful colour. Uh, just a little bit of information for you. Uh, technically, it's the most visible, so possibly that's why schools choose red. So as our children move between their homes and school, they are easily visible. In terms of the light and yeah. the eye's ability to pick yeah, up on the spectrum. Right. Um, so that's why it's so effective as traffic lights all over the world. Um, however, um, I think within our learning environments, it can really be quite um, sort of dis disturbing in my equilibrium as I look around the space, it can distract me. Uh, there's lots of um, information, and we've got the, re the reference to this project around the colour and its effects on us, um, but really I suppose think about your learning environment and do you have a colour explosion? Are there ways that you might want to be able to target the use of colour to support engagement in your environment? Much like light, are you a sort of walk into the room and turn the lights on kind of person? Or are you the one that comes back just behind that person and turns the lights off? There's a kind of little war going on. There's <laughs> one person in your team turns the lights off and the other turns them on. But light levels stimulate brain activity in different ways and often they'll generate physical uh, reactions. Okay, so if you think about colours impacting on our emotions there and the spatial effects in the room, similarly light levels, when they're wrong, can show that children lose the ability to attend, to maintain their concentration. It's, it's overwhelming, it's tiring, and that can have an impact. So think about your setting. What sort of lighting do you have? Interestingly enough, next to the strip lighting is a little picture of a setting um, from Denmark where they only used house lamps. So there was a link to home, um, but the lighting therefore was low level, soft, and not overpowering, right. so it felt That's far more natural. Okay, so um, do you have clear windows? Have you covered up your windows, blocking the natural light coming in? Um, or do you use windows as display boards? So I think sometimes we lose the opportunity to really flood in natural light um, because we've, we've blocked it. Um, and then also, if your children are sleeping during their time with you, are those sleep areas darker, quieter? Are they conducive to encourage naps? We know that too much light is being linked to potential childhood obesity. So we've got to think about when it's appropriate, can we ensure we've got darker areas so that our children really do sleep well. Um, so, uh, sensory stimulation, if you're thinking about the um, child coming into a space, if we are overly bright, it's a sensory overload, and increasingly our children who maybe have um, other, I suppose, um, challenges, so maybe they're uh, particularly on the autistic spectrum um, and our SEND children, we have to consider ways of reducing that sensory overload. Otherwise, they're constantly going to be um, overly stimulated and in, an, uh, in a place of tension. Okay, so we're just going to think about resources now. You can see here in the pictures, we've purposely gone for pictures that are sort of self-chosen learning resources and things that hopefully cardboard boxes and wicker baskets are relatively cheap, inexpensive resources that children still get a lot of fun and stimulation from and are great opportunities for language learning. So really this slides in here for you just to again think about and spend some time observing what the children are actually playing with in your environment. Is it the 
the expenses resources that are favoured, or as can be seen from the picture here, are the cheaper alternatives more popular? Um, we recently attended a really successful outdoor event last Saturday in the South End, um, and one of the things that we put out was some um, guttering. Um, and we propped it up on cardboard boxes, funny enough, and just had opportunities for children to play with either small world figures or cars or water, just trickling it down the guttering into various pots or just onto the grass. And we had several parents comment and say, crikey, you know, there I was about to go back home and thinking of the lovely weather, going to buy an expensive, all singing, all dancing, you know, construction object or slide or whatever it happened to be for the children in the garden didn't realise that a little bit of guttering and some cardboard boxes and very natural materials could actually stimulate this much learning mm -hmm. and fun um, and obviously vocabulary learning at the same time. So just think about those resources, have a little audit and see what it is that the children are actually playing with. Do they need all those expensive bits and bobs? So in the next slide, you can see we've got three separate pictures here. This is really just to reiterate the use of the natural resources, like I've just said, using very basic, very sort of um, uh, stuff that you might have hanging around in your garden or outside um, is really, really good and useful to use with the children and obviously very inexpensive. Um, the second picture shows if you are going to put things into boxes, Think about your labelling of what's inside the boxes. As Sean was saying, if a child is walking over to try and get something, is it obvious what's actually inside the box? Have we got the label with a picture on the outside and then following it up with the actual word so that children can see the, the correlation between the two? And also in the third picture here, you can see trying to encourage children to keep resources tidy. You know, we talked about earlier on the self-selection and if children keep getting resources out and out and out, and then that creates that quite a overstimulated environment. Let's think about encouraging our children to keep the resources tidy and keep the resources in neat, self-contained boxes if we can. <laughs> so they're sort of set up from the get-go and it doesn't become a, a bit of a pickle later on when you've got to tidy everything away. And they know where the resources go. Okay. So this other slide here, we can just see, again, natural resources generally. Um, being used here and particularly in the picture on the left there's a very low palette that has been used here as a table rather than higher table or a table and chairs because generally children like to be either at the same height as the activities or sitting on the floor we don't need to provide children with tables and chairs because basically they ignore the chairs they get pushed in they're in their way whatever they're trying to reach um, so just think about the height of the resources that you're putting out as well <coughs> Okay, so we're now thinking about the outdoors. We've kind of hinted at that in the last little few slides. So basically, outdoor learning has recently, over the last few years, really gained momentum and is receiving a, a lot more attention from experts and political figures. And, and there have been several projects recently and programs that have been run based on outdoor learning and how outdoor learning can really demonstrate a massively huge impact on pupils' enjoyment of sessions, their connection to nature, it has an impact on their social skills, their general engagement with learning, um, health and well-being, and also behaviour and attainment. Um, and there's recently been um, something called the HAPPEN project, which stands for Health and Attainment of Pupils in a Primary Education Network. And whilst we're not talking about primary school children, I still think the research is quite handy to look at. And in this, pupils were engaging in curriculum-linked outdoor learning activities for about an hour a week. Um, and basically, the summary of the findings of the research was that the, the children that participated reiterated that being outside um, was brilliant for them. Um, they got a lot more done, they thoroughly enjoyed themselves, and um, the teachers and the researchers could see a wide range of benefits to the pupils and the practitioners to do with well-being and learning in general. So on the next slide, there's a lovely quote from a child who summed it up, really. So when we go out to the woods, we don't really know we're doing it, but we're actually doing maths and we're doing English, so it's just making it educational and fun at the same time. 
Oh, what age was that child? <laughs> three. <laughs> <laughs> you two to a nine to a I do think, you know, if you were to ask the average child, you know, yes. if, if they were going outside, do they think they're learning? Generally, they don't. They don't think yeah. they're learning when they're outside. They're playing. Um, so it's up to us to, to make it as fun um, and get out outside as much as we possibly can. Okay, so you can see here, um, this is taken from White and Stockland's um, research, and basically they're saying that all the manufactured equipment and all the indoor instructional materials produced by the best educators in the world cannot substitute for the primary experience of hands-on engagement with nature. And I love this next paragraph because I think even the way they've described it here, it suggests the language opportunities that can be exploited. So they cannot replace the sensory moment where a child's attention is captured by the phenomena and materials of nature, the dappled sparkle of sunlight through leaves, the sound and motion of plants in the wind, the sight of butterflies or a colony of ants, the imaginative worlds of a square yard of dirt or sand, and the endless sensory experience of water. I mean, how beautiful is that? It's so, um, yeah, just wanted to add that in. Okay. So, again, um, from their article, same article, um, this was called Children's Outdoor and Play Learning Environments. They asked children what they like in an outdoor area. So, I'm not going to read through that one, but you can just see that it's, again, the natural things that are occurring outside as much as possible. I'm just scanning it. Does it say mud? Yeah, no, I can't think it does. I don't know. Looks and sand. Okay, I'll give you sand. Yeah, mud we can talk about. We could have that. Definitely. Yeah. One, of, one of the nice ways of finding out what our children really are engaged in and really like is to actually give the voice to the child. Mm -hmm. So that can be done with a little camera or a toy. Mm -hmm. And, and you're, you're, you explain to the child that this character, if it's a bear, is going to be coming to join the nursery and he needs to know where the best places are to play. And so then they can take the bear to visit the various different areas mm. and that gives you a quick straw poll mm. um, from the adult's side of knowing, ah oh, right, so they're really enjoying this. We did this once with the setting and they took pictures, this little one went out and took pictures and it was of the slide. So the um, adult in the in the setting said, Oh, you like the slide, the slide thing? And he said, No, no. And he just pointed because he didn't have the words to be able to express himself, but he pointed to under the slide. And guess what was under the slide, my right. God? Right. Yes. yes. <laughs> so this is obviously in an ideal world if you can get outside. Yeah, so I'm just going to do it now the next slide. So I suppose it's important just to think, well, what are those elements that we know makes a difference? And if we can't, if we haven't got that outside area that's accessible to us immediately, then what can we bring as in the outside in? So the pictures show maybe a little den, den that you might have created outside, so why not create a den inside your space? Um, however, we know lots of you out there are really creative and determined to take your children into their local environment. So um, one little setting we know, they borrowed, shall we say, a trolley from their local supermarket and each day they fill their trolley with the current um, resources that the children enjoy, stream, etc. and then push that to down the road to their little local outdoor parking space and uh, after doing a little environmental search for any unwanted objects, yes. uh, they then play there for an hour every day. So, you know, there are always ways and means of accessing your outdoor space. Um, yeah. Over to, over to you, right, next slide, sorry. Um, again, these are just more examples of um, outdoor experiences inside. So, water, sand, construction, and on to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. So, are you listening? Because the most important resource is, of course, um, ourselves. 
okay? We need to consider what we need to change and extend or develop or build and challenge our children's interests and needs and development skills and their knowledge and understanding. And that's, for many of us, is absolutely second nature from watching our children. But sometimes what we forget is are we also reflecting on the language opportunities? Which words and what type of language is already being used? And therefore, what new words could you then be using and introducing into that child's play? Okay, in order to be able to extend and develop that language. So the goal, of course, is for every child to be confident and a capable communicator and a confident language user. So, let's take the lead from them and ensure that the experience is positive. Let's also ensure that they're, that we are talking to someone, not everyone, that we're yeah. tuning into those individual children and talking about what interests them and knowing what the next steps are for their language development. We also need to know the children very well, talking about what interests them. We need to share their attention, joint interest and involvement in experiences and, and those that are often spontaneous. So being ready to put the planning aside and go with the flow. You know, if they decide to go off on one tangent, start talking about something that you weren't hadn't planned for, just go with it. And finally, reflect the characteristics of home interaction. So this means really um, how practitioners are reflecting and mirroring how parents react to their children at home, so expanding on children's language, almost preempting what the children are going to say or do, being ready for them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, a book uh, recently published called Interacting or Interfering by Judy Fisher kind of um, explored all of those various different um, sort of skills that we bring into our interactions with children. And what she uh, and others have suggested is that actually we reduce the number of questions that we ask children. If you remember previously, we've always talked about the hand drill. So, you know, before we ask a question, can we think about um, maybe modelling the language instead, um, showing our children through our actions what might happen next. Uh, could we suggest, use language of suggestion, and provide options um, and choices, um, give children explanations and demonstrate to them perhaps what might, um, what, what might be the options to, to explore. Um, how do we encourage um, children to be independent but also to be con confident enough to want to communicate? Um, can we remind children? Um, can we talk about our own actions and also what they are actually doing? Because if I'm not hearing an adult talking about what I'm doing or what I'm showing, maybe through my face and gestures, how do I know what I'm feeling is angry or happy. If people don't respond. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. If no one says, oh, look at your face, you look like you're really thinking, yeah, you've got that furrow across your brow, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, now you know what you're doing, you're thinking. Okay, so remember, your voice though has to be heard. We have to, if we're thinking about surrounding our children in a sea of words, are the words meaningful? Are they being heard? Are we making sure that as I give that commentary, that that little one is looking at me? Because maybe the most impactful thing is when you're busy and you're not looking at me, I actually don't talk. Right. And then when you turn to me, then I carry on my, com my commentary. Um, so Kina Cummings has done a lot of research around this and that children who sometimes haven't developed the skill of face watching or turning to look to see where that voice is coming from sometimes can be delayed in their communication skills. So she really advocates not eye contact as such, but face watching. Okay, so just to summarise, when considering your learning environment and making it um, a communication friendly space or a language rich space, consider what does it look like, what does it feel like, what are the adults doing and what does it sound like. So fingers crossed we've been through our aims.
Like, I'm going to take you back to the first. <laughs> and um, good luck with it. We, uh, we hope that you found today quite useful. Thank you both. That's been fascinating. Um, I particularly like this, the phrase I'm just going to be the chair's probably to take yeah. back. Surrounding our children in the sea of words. Um, quite a lovely phrase, uh, as was the paragraph from the research. Um, and it's one of the things that I know in the DfE's um, approach to speech and language, the Hungry Little Minds element, and Ofsted's approach, the issue of using stories because it introduces and often repeats language words that are not everyday language. And that is what is important in our role in terms of extending children's everyday vocabulary in ways that take us forward. Um, but for those of you who are with us regularly, you'll know I don't um, extend these um, sessions artificially. If there are any questions from those of you attending, then I'll please do type them whilst I am just wittering away. Mm -hmm. um, and it just leads me to move to the final slide in time, just to make sure that people are aware of some of the other resources that are available uh, to support um, these, these areas of activity. And we, this, as I've said before, these, the recording of this webinar will be on the website. So if you don't have time to write those down now or take a photograph of it with your phone, it will be available to view on the, the webinar download. Um, and just some, some of the references for the information that has backed up today. If you want to do further reading or find further information to take your knowledge and skills further on this, then there are those references added at the end as well. With no questions coming in, that looks like we've come to our natural end, so it just remains for me to say thank you as ever to Lindsay Shah, and supported painfully by Isabel in the background. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all, and it just remains for me to say to enjoy your summer holidays if they are pending. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.